uh, thanks in advance for your time here. Going to go through leading a sustainable safety culture. That's what we do at Sea Change. Okay. Um, there's some of the clients we work with, mainly large pharmaceutical manufacturing clients. We're based in NACE. Um, I'm MD. Our whole background is lean management organizational psychology. Risk management experts, and we focus on real sustainable behavioral safety. Some of the places we work throughout Europe. Okay, I'm going to bring it through our philosophy and then some evidence-based research. And really what today is about is understanding what leads to unsafe behaviors in a manufacturing uh, or pharmaceutical context, okay, or a workplace context. Because a lot of times we focus on behavior, but that's like folks on the tip of the iceberg, okay. So not only compliance, but behavior is even the tip of the iceberg. So we're going to go a bit underneath that today and figure out why people do what they do when it comes to safety. So we believe safety is a bit of a problem when it comes to behavior. Okay, if we look at this, the Bradley curve, which you're probably all familiar with, there's four levels, ad hoc, level one, and local ownership, level four, where it's really the goal of every sustainable safety culture. Okay, a lot of behavior focuses on these two. Okay, so policing the safety message, policing compliance, policing people, okay, managing safety. That's a hard thing to do. Whereas sustainability is at levels three and four. Okay, so that's what we're really trying to push. And how do you get there? That's the challenge for every organization. Okay? We have to deal with the issue of perspective. Everyone's different. Okay? Everyone's different. And we don't, in our, in our opinion, organizations don't take that into account uh, enough. Okay? So let's, let's examine that. This is all based on kind of research that we would have done, but let's look at cultural contradictions and variations within people. What are you likely to find? Okay? On a good day, we're looking at three levels of, our, of management or organization. We're going to talk about the operations, frontline management, which is really important when it comes to safety management, and senior management. On a good day, okay, let's look at what happens from a safety perspective. Safety is really important here. I better not take a chance. Let's get things organized properly and ensure that the task is safe. Safety first at all costs. Always take time to plan for safety. Okay? The very next day, we could have something like this. It's okay to take a chance just this once nobody's looking. Let's get things moving by whatever means possible. It's okay to turn a blind eye. Nobody got hurt. Okay? Does everyone understand? what I'm talking about here. This is the reality that we're uncovering. Let's go again. On a good day, I'm going to raise issues when I see them so we can improve. Everybody should go out for issues and we will sort them out together. We actively promote don't walk by, get back to everyone who raises an issue. Okay? And again, on a bad day, little or no feedback here, we're kept waiting for word. Just get on with the job, I don't have feedback for you yet. Do I have to get back to people with bad news? Because that is not an easy thing to do. All right. And then you throw in on top of that the cultural breakdown within organizations. Again, you will find this across my business, which has 20 staff, or a massive multinational, which has 30,000 staff. You'll find the same breakdown here when it comes to attitude towards safety, and generally attitude towards everything. Okay. You're going to get the 15% who are positive willing to help themselves and others. You wish you could replicate that 15%. You're going to get the opposite side of the spectrum, 15% who are generally negative and defensive. Okay, it's just the breakdown within culture. And then 70% are kind of somewhere in the middle. So the challenge for every organization when it comes to safety culture and the safety message is, how do you make sure the 70% shifts this direction? and not that direction. And when we go back to the initial Bradley curve, if we just focus on compliance and policing only, where do you think that's going to go? That way. Okay, so what systems can we put in to pull it this way? Let's look at the pain with traditional behavior-based safety. It's considered theoretical. It misses upstream prevailing attitudes or resistance, like we talk about on a bad day. What's happening there? Okay, and how do you address that from a behavioral perspective? For staff, contractors, they feel like they're treated like children, okay, which is actually can increase risk and is um, opposite to autonomous thinking. 
and resorting to counting behaviours, observations can, be on a tick box, can become a tick box exercise. It's also very peer based, okay, which is a hard thing to do. You know, observation tours. Me, I might go out on a Friday night with the guy I'm observing. Am I really going to be honest and truthful? I doubt it. Okay, and when it's not real, when behaviour based safety programmes are not real, which often happens, here's what happens. We count observations at a month's end, lists that choke resources, and high expectations result in disappointment. Okay, so again, operational end of it, frontline end of it, senior management end of it. Okay? So when it's been done badly, guys, trust can get damaged, there's resistance, disappointment, and people feel unimportant. Okay? So it's a real, this is a real risk. Okay? A lot of people think, look, we'll throw a behavior-based safety program at this problem, and yet they can actually cause more harm than good. So here's our hypothesis, here was our hypothesis uh, uh, about three to four years ago. We kind of said, right, is behavior-based safety, is that the be all and end all? What's there before that? Okay? And our hypothesis was that there seems to be two dimensions here when it comes to the safety message and safety culture. There seems to be the engineered part, okay, which is kind of what can be constructed, but there's also the real stuff, there's the natural stuff, how I feel, the issue of perspective. Okay? And for people, in our opinion, to own safety on both sides must be satisfied. The engineered part, putting the structure in place, okay, so I feel safe, okay, but also is it real, does it apply to me? Okay? So people need to trust the what, which is the minds, and they also need to value the how. How do I feel on a heart level? Okay? So if you look at the trust dimension, what's threatened here, or what threatens it is contradiction. Okay? Things must be consistent. Okay? So if I'm working in any business and I see contradictions around me, straight away I'm going to think, I don't trust this. That's going to damage that side of it. Think about when you're a kid, or think about your children if you have any, right? If you say, you shouldn't do that, don't do that, and then you do it right in front of your kid, what, what are they going to think? All right? And then feeling valued on the other side, communication must be personal. Feedback, again, issues of perspective. Are people being valued and heard? And that can be threatened by lack of attention. Classic one is, I've brought this problem of this issue on my machine to my frontline manager for the last six months and it's still a problem. Okay? That's a, an issue from a safety culture point of view. And again, that's going to move that 70% down the wrong way. So here was our research. Okay? Our, our hypothesis was there's something more than behavior here. We have to get underneath it, look at the attitudes, and we thought maybe there was two dimensions. Okay? There was that trust side of it, there was that value side. We, looked at, we focused in on um, FMCG, okay, domain, uh, sample size is about 1,200, operational focus, we used mixed methods, which is qualitative and quantitative, factor analysis, okay, and then we basically, after the factor analysis, came up with an intervention, put the intervention in, and then did reanalysis, all right? So here's what we found very quickly, sustainability focus on root cause attitudes. Every behavior had a root cause attitude when we looked into this. Okay, so not enough time to get the job done safely was the root cause attitude leading to not putting a harness on when working at height. I'm uncomfortable flagging unsafe practices when I see them. I don't like conflict. That was the attitude leading to rules get broken with no fear of consequences, so I break the rules. I prioritize production targets over health and safety and drive this on a daily basis. If my manager is not interested, then why should I bother wearing PPE? Okay. So, what we actually found was 14 latent attitudes that lead to unsafe behaviors, right? I can't show you the, the, the article attitudes because you'll have to work with us to see them. But seven on the left, seven on the right, okay? Trust and value. Actually, I'm just going to go back to that quickly. Just ensure that assurance that we will be okay, safety, security, predictability, guidelines, rules, procedures. They are very important. But what you find is some organizations put way too much time, focus, money, and I'm talking millions, at this side, right? And they ignore this side, which is confidence in myself and peers. Again, esteem, acceptance, empathy, sensitivity, and, and feedback, okay? Being heard. 
Okay, just as important. And some organizations focus too much on this and they don't have the rules in place. It's a balance, mothering, fathering, okay? So one of, what we look at in terms of our culture change program is we've taken that research we've done and we actually do a culture footprint. So we map your, any organization on this. And that's where we start is the, is the footprint. So we can basically see the spread between your trust factors and your value factors. And that allows us to say, well, here's the problem, here's the gaps, here's what we have to address. The way we address it, guys, is through prioritization, local ownership, engaging, simple, operationally focused systems. So our, our risk assessments are visual, okay? Uh, again, we focus on local ownership, SAP prioritization, safety action teams, keep it competitive, keep it people focused. Um, again, visualizing the risk and upscale the how. One of the biggest things is frontline management, right? Oftentimes that's the pinch point frontline management, and it's not, it's not their fault, it's just that they may not know how to lead effectively behavior-based safety. Okay, so we do a lot of work on, on, on improving the leadership skills at that level. Here were the results when we went back in with our four-stage program. Cellular ownership in local zones, sustainable safety expectations from the ground up, improved safety stats, guys, LTIs went down, NLTIs went down, unsafe catches up, increased feedback, connection regarding people's ideas and initiatives, leadership and internal communication. What would people, the feedback was we, have, we now have a language, we now have a way of communicating this, which is really important. Global and internal recognition. Okay, so what happened with the, with the sites we worked with is that they actually won internal uh, and external health and safety awards, which is fantastic. Increased production benefits. So health and safety is key because it's the first level of Maslow's hierarchy of needs. You're all, you're all aware of that. That's why it's very fundamentally important to every employee, okay? Um, but as you hit that, everything else kind of, all boats rise. So we actually found uh, increased production benefits around housekeeping, ASAP, etc., and general staff morale. So the whole thing there is two dimensions. We've got the trust, the value side, consistency, involvement, and that's where you get best practice. So how do you do that? How do you achieve that? Okay? And again, that's through the systems uh, that we've put in. So how we communicate is the key that unlocks this. Okay, the truth within each organization, and it's all about your message and communicating from the top. Again, these are just some of the results, guys, in terms of audit scores, accidents, resulting claims, and then morale and, pro morale and productivity. Okay, so we've just seen uh, the audit scores going up, accidents claims obviously going down, staff morale, productivity up. Okay, and that's an average across the organizations we'd worked with. So just to wrap up, guys, what is it? What we talked about, sustainable behavioral safety, okay, affects the attitudes. And again, attitudes are the first place to look at, okay, before you look at behavior-based intervention. Okay, 14 factors lead to unsafe behaviors, and the, the breakdown is around the trust dimension and the value dimension, okay? And that's the first step in leading real change. You don't want to change something and get a peak and then it's gone, okay, within six months. You want sustainable change over time. Remember the culture breakdown? You want to take that 70% and move them up into the top 15%. And finally, how do you do that? Which is often the challenge. Clear, simple, practical, and engaging solutions that allow people trust the message and take local ownership for safe behaviors. That's how you do it. Okay, whether you do that, come up with that yourself, or whether you talk to somebody like Sea Change, that's how you do it. Okay, thank you.